The word of the Lord this morning comes to us from Psalm 118, verse 19 through 24. The scripture reading is available in your bulletin as well as the screen in front of you. Now, if you're there, I invite you to rise in body or in spirit so that we can honor the sacredness of God's holy word. It's only a few verses, so I'll invite us to read this together in one voice. Ready, begin. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. You may be seated. Please join me in prayer once again. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from the grave. You've crowned him Lord of all. Forgive us and raise us from sin so that we may be your faithful people, obeying the commands of our Lord and Savior. As we open up your word, speak to us so that we can indeed be obedient to the plans that you have for us. For this we pray in your holy name and all God's people say, amen. amen. Now it's recorded that Psalm 118 was written for the Feast of Tabernacles, which was most likely celebrated, uh, celebrated the feast when the people returned from uh, the exile and in, and in reestablishing God's nation to triumph and rule. Now this psalm was probably sung at Jesus' entry into Jerusalem at the beginning of Passion Week. And this psalm was probably shared in the upper room after the Lord's Supper. But you see, this psalm of praise is important because it praises the Lord's loyal covenantal love. The psalmist recounts how the Lord triumphed over the nation surrounding Israel. He raises the fact that salvation was not of our work, but of the Lord. And that the work of the Lord was yet still rejected over and over again as our cornerstone. You see, these verses we read this morning remind us of the psalmist's triumph, that there is victory in the Lord. Go back to our passage with me. If you look at verse 19, it says, Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. The fact that these gates are there in front of our eyes, that's victory. The fact that God calls us his beloved, the moment that we enter through those gates, that's victory. You see, that victory doesn't come from our strength. The psalmist here joyfully praises the Lord as his strength, as his source of song, as his source of joy, as his salvation. Verse 21 says, I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. We don't save ourselves. We don't own our salvation. It's not about us. It's not on us, but the Lord. But there are so many times we seek credit. There are so many times we want to do it our way. Can I get a witness? There are so many times where we're so focused on trying to be the Messiah because, oh, let me go help save them. Let me go make food for them. Oh, they're probably going to be struggling, so let me do this for them. Let me do that for them. Uh, am, I, am I pinching a nerve or somebody? Am, am I, are you feeling a little, oh, man, he's talking about me. But we're focused on trying to be that one person. Why are we trying to do everything? The psalmist is declaring this testimony because he knows that he's going to live and enter through the gates of righteousness. He knows that it's a privilege because death will be defeated many, many years later. He knows that that's what it's all about. He knows that he can give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Since the beginning of time, since day one, his love endured forever. The psalmist is testifying of this anticipation of what it's going to be like in joining the congregation in the sanctuary to praise the Lord for his great salvation, for his deliverance. 
I can't wait for the day when COVID restrictions go away. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> so that we can sing together. Pack the house of God together. If you recall uh, the uh, fall of 2019, uh, we had the privilege to host my father's congregation. And we had over 120 people packed in the sanctuary. And singing together, it is well, it is well with my soul. Can we live with that anticipation? Can we live with that hope? But for some reason, we forget about that. We're so caught up in the things of the world, we forget about that anticipation. We forget about that hope. We forget about that testimony that indeed his love endures forever. The psalm here almost makes it feel like it's New Testament-esque with how it's written. But you see, that's the power of God's word. Oh, wait, that's a new Old Testament verse. Why, is, oh, why does it feel like it's a New Testament verse? Well, it's because that's the power of God's word. God's word is alive. It transcends generations. It transcends culture, seasons, languages, and more. It's not an American God. It's not a Canadian God. It's our God. For indeed, he works from this village to this town to that city to one corner of the world to the other corner of the world, right? We should probably have 195 flags in our sanctuary because God works in and every way. Amen? Yet even in that power, people still reject God. Even with that power, even with all the evidence in the world, people still reject the gospel to this day. Verse 22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It's almost like the psalmist knew many, many years later, thousands of years later, people are still going to reject the one. Yet that one that was rejected will become the important puzzle piece that we need, the cornerstone. Think about it. Jacob, Joseph, David, they were all rejected and then raised high. If you think about Jesus, he was rejected because they didn't approve of his origin. They rejected Jesus because they didn't approve of his lack of formal education. Oh, you don't have a doctorate, Jesus? Okay. They rejected Jesus because of his disregard for religious traditions. They didn't approve of his choice of friends. Yet he became the chief cornerstone. God established Jesus as the chief cornerstone because that was the plan since day one. The Lord knew. Now there are, more, there are so many people that misconstrue this and say, Oh, uh, you need to suffer in order to grow in Christ. If you're not suffering then you're not getting closer to Christ. But that's not what Scripture is teaching us. Scripture is teaching us that no matter what you are going through, no matter how high the high the lows or low the lows, no matter what you are going through, even in your rebellion, even in your rejection, Christ is still the cornerstone. Christ is still the cornerstone. These statements are so important that Jesus quotes it himself all throughout the New Testament. Peter quotes it in reference to Jesus in Acts. Paul alludes to it in Ephesians. No text in the Old Testament is, is quoted more in the New Testament. The psalmist continues to testify that the Lord had taken that stone that the builders had rejected and made it into the cornerstone, the capstone of the nation. Therefore, the people should rejoice. It's almost like, if I can try to put it in a 21st century analogy. Oh, have you been rejected because of your faith? Oh, then you won. Have you tried sharing the gospel and you were turned down? Oh, that means you won. Rejection in the eyes of the world is victory in the eyes of Christ. Amen. You know, Maybe during those days, people devalued and discounted Israel as a great nation. But the Lord took that stone and made it into the cornerstone of his rule on earth. 
Later on in the New Testament, in Matthew, we see Jesus' parable of the landowner and tenants in Matthew 21, where he applies the psalm in the way where Jesus is the stone and the Jewish leaders, the builders of the nation that had rejected him. But the fact of the matter is this. This psalm showcases God's sovereignty, that the purpose and plan of Christ was set since day one. I don't know about you, but that should cause us to want to worship him that much more. Wow, God knew everything since day one. For I know the plans that I have for you. God knew those plans. You talk to me about five years ago, ten years ago, and, and someone tells me, you know, James, you're going to be the head pastor of a beautiful congregation in a town called East Islip, New York. Sorry, is that a hamlet? What's a hamlet? If someone ever told me that, I'd probably be like, oh, what are you talking about? East Islip? But God knew. God knew. Many, many years ago, when I was growing up in Southern California, all I knew was Southern California. Being born and bred and the palm trees and, you know, the beautiful weather. I didn't know what the white stuff falling from the sky was. I didn't know what the snow shovel or plowing. I didn't know any of that. But God knew. Many, many years later, I'd be shoveling out my driveway. God knew that I would meet my beautiful wife in New York of all places. God knew that I would meet a wife who doesn't like California. But God knew since day one. And if we take a step back and reflect on our lives, especially on this Resurrection Sunday, and if we can recount every step and go, wow, instead of saying God was there, what if we say God knew? God knew. Right? Last weekend, we heard a beautiful testimony from our sister, Cynthia. Right? Randomly walked into a church thinking that, oh, maybe this might be a place where I'll get married, but ends up becoming her new church family. But that's not spontaneity. God knew. Amen? <laughs> God knew. That's the beauty of what this psalm is trying to teach us. Verse 23. This is the Lord's doing. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Can you imagine, right? The Lord singing the psalm, the Lord sharing this psalm in the upper room with his disciples, the Last Supper, knowing what was going to happen. Can you imagine him saying, his love endures forever? Can you imagine him talking about this salvation, even though he knew someone was going to betray him, even though he knew that he was going to die for the sins of the world, that he would be rejected, that he would become the chief cornerstone? It's because, it's because of that we can rejoice. Because that's the kind of God we get to worship. A God who knew that even in the face of rejection, even in the face of betrayal, he held on because he already knew what was going to happen. He knew on the night that he was betrayed, he knew what would happen a couple days later. He knew that in the sins and misery of the world on that dark Friday night, he knew that Sunday was coming. Hallelujah. That's why we're here. That's why we can breathe. That's why we can say we are sons and daughters of Christ. That no matter how many times we try to run away from the Lord, he has brought us back. And we can also testify and say, I might not have the best track record out there. I may not be the best Christian out there. I may not know Genesis to Revelation. But at the end of the day, what I do know is that Jesus loves me. For this I know. And then that can be our testimony. Because God knew. 
because God knew. That's why we're here to rejoice and be glad, not only in the Lord's day, but in every day. We see this as an opportunity to truly declare this testimony upon Jesus entering Jerusalem with the Hosannas welcoming him as Israel's savior. That indeed the walls have come crumbling down, the boundaries have come tumbling down, death has been defeated, there is freedom. I titled this message, Give Thanks to the Lord. Because there are so many things that we need to give thanks for. But it's not to one another, but it's to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. There's nothing in that verse that says, give thanks to the Lord, for indeed you passed your Bible exam at church at Sunday school. You, you memorize gen, all of Genesis, right? Or you beat Mel in the Bible trivia, right? <laughs> There's nothing like that that says it right there. But it says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. We're gathered here not only to celebrate the risen Savior, but we're gathered here to once again testify to one another but the Lord but the Lord. We're gathered here once again, week in and week out, not because Pastor James is gonna call you first thing and say, why weren't you at church? But because we're gathered here to share in that grace, that who, what a week I had. But I am not alone. Death has been defeated. Christ has won. I say this many, many times. We may lose a couple battles, but this morning we are reminded once again that the war has already been won. St. Cyril of Jerusalem once said, a fiery sword barred of old the gates of paradise, a fiery tongue which brought salvation restored that gift. This morning, we're not here because of us. We're be here because of the Lord. We're here because once again we want to proclaim Christ and say that the war has already been won. We not only celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior this morning, we recommit to the Lord once again that we will indeed declare this prayer. We will indeed declare this testimony where we say, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Let us pray.